are listening to the Discerning Leader Podcast, brought to you by Leadership Transformations, the podcast that helps you practice a preference for God. And now, here's your host, Steve Machia. Thank you, dear friend, for joining us on the Discerning Leader Podcast, where together we're discovering how best to practice a preference for God in all aspects of our personal lives and relationships in our leadership and service to others. My name is Steve Machia, and I welcome you on behalf of the entire Leadership Transformations team. For more than 20 years now, our ministry has focused on the spiritual formation, discernment, and renewal of leaders and learners who are serving the church and building up God's kingdom literally worldwide. To learn more about our work and to sign up for Pathways, our weekly e-newsletter, simply go to leadershiptransformations.org. And as we enter into today's episode, let me invite us all to slow down and attend to what God wants to say to us. Let's prayerfully reflect for just a moment on the reality of the initiating presence of our triune God, the love and compassion of our Heavenly Father, the grace and forgiveness of our Savior Jesus, and the empowering presence of the Spirit we call holy. Let us hold fast to an awareness of God's presence, his power, and his peace. And let's trust God even more deeply today. Friends, we are in season 28, which we've entitled Silencio. Reflective Practices for Nurturing Your Soul, and my conversation partner for the entirety of season 28 is my dear brother and friend, Matt Scott. Matt, welcome back to the Discerning Leader podcast. Hey, thank you, Steve. It's great to be with you today. I'm thrilled, man. Delighted with these conversations. I know that you believe in these practices, so you're a trustworthy conversation partner. So I'm really excited that we're doing this together. And um, for those who are meeting Matt for the first time, Matt is LTI's creative director and minister of spiritual formation, one of a handful of spirit ministers of spiritual formation on our team. Went to Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, where he and I first met when he was a student. And I was the old guy in the circle facilitating spiritual formation. And uh, we've stayed connected ever since. Matt was on the team immediately after um, his seminary days. And then he went to work in a local church for almost a decade. And now he's back with us and we're thrilled. So Matt, uh, thank you and Kristen and Emerson and Ashton for being a part of our lives. We love your family and we love that you're a part of our family. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I love being a part of the LTI family as well. The joy is mine, and it is, it is really life-giving to have these conversations with you, Steve, and to share with the Discerning Leader podcast listening community um, some of these practices, and we hope that people will enter in more fully and experience these ways of forming and shaping their soul ever more into the image of Christ. And today we're looking at this practice of journaling. Journaling. And as, as we talked about in the last episode on reflection, journaling is one way of practicing reflection, of remembering and giving thanks, of previewing and reviewing our day. And so, Steve, I just want to dive right in and ask you, what are some thoughts that you have on this practice of journaling? What does that look like for you? How have you done that over the years? Thanks, Matt. I want to start with um, a passage of scripture, which we normally do each time we're together. And the one we chose for this time is from Exodus chapter 17. And just very briefly, um, it's when the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. And Moses says to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. 
as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. A great story, Matt. I love this story because it's it speaks of the power of God. It speaks of the authority of God. It speaks to the importance of leadership, Moses and Joshua. It speaks to the importance of having your hands held up in prayer. I love that. You know, when Moses' hands grew tired, what'd they do? They got a stone, they put it under him, and they sat on it. And then Aaron and her held up his hands, one on either side. And then at the end of the battle, God says um, to Moses, write it down, write it down, write it down, find a scroll and write it down and make sure that Joshua, the one who's going to follow after you, hears about it because I'm going to completely blot out your enemy's name from under heaven. So talk about the discipline of journaling and reflection. It's right there. It's right there in the Older Testament, you know, Exodus chapter 17. So I'm inspired by that, Matt, because not only did did, uh, Moses do as he was told, but so did every single one of the biblical authors were able to record for us in our generation the scriptures, the Holy Bible. The thing that is most and best and longest standing preserved item in the entirety of our world. That's just amazing to me, Matt. Mm -hmm. So we've got the recorded, written out word, sort of like God's journal is the Bible. And he tells us story after story after story after story, which basically invite us into loving faithfulness to him regardless of whether we see the results like Moses saw with the defeat of the Amalekites. So I'm inspired by this whole journaling concept because I think it's very historical, incredibly biblical. And as a result, it helps us to remember when we journal, when we write things out. Now, is there a Bible verse in the Bible that says, thou shalt journal? No, there's no... There's no order. There's, it's, it's like if you don't journal, it's not the end of the world. Um, and it's not the only practice that you're to, to practice as a Christ follower. But boy, is it good for your soul. And speak from your experience, because you're, you're a journaler. What does this mean to you? Yeah, I was recently moving some things around and up in the attic, I guess, yeah, taking down Christmas decorations and shuffling some things and ran across a box of journals that I've been lugging around from this town to that town, this home to that home. And looking back, realizing this was something that I did in high school and college. Hmm. I'm not really sure how it started for me. Perhaps it was taking notes at church or being in a small group with some other guys when I was, yeah, in those younger years. But I've been in the practice of journaling really for several decades. And I think for me, that whole write it down thing has been incredibly important. And it's not as even, it's not as though I go back and reread all of those journals. There's just something about writing it down, um, taking the time to process what I'm thinking, feeling, experiencing, noticing all the highs and lows of that ways in which God feels near the way in which God feels absent, the ways in which perhaps I hear him speaking or the ways he may feel silent. All of that to me has been incredibly helpful 
uh, and important. And, you know, you've, you've referenced before being a, a musician and a songwriter. I, I think for me, I can hear a song truly dozens and dozens of times and the lyrics are, they just don't stick. But if I write them down one time, there's, they're, they're inside of me. So there is just something for me personally, very profound about writing things down. It sticks, it goes deeper into my soul, into my mind and in my memory. Um, and it's been yeah. very significant for me. Well, when you think of even something as simple as um, an instruction manual, having it written down helps the next person, right? Yeah. Or you're a musician to write the music out, preserves it for the next generation. Mm -hmm. for us to be able to so so journaling and as a practice has been going on for a long long time and we just need to figure out how is it that we're going to remember and give thanks and is it going to be a journal or not and i would suggest that for those who are listening and who are not a journaler or who have not ever uh practiced this or maybe maybe it's a dormant practice that they have let let go for a while First of all, don't be hard on yourself, you know, because it's no big deal. It's not, it's not like, you know, you're, you're like off, off in the distance somewhere because you haven't been journaling for a while. No, it's just, it may be an invitation for you to come back to the journaling practice to help you remember and give thanks. Cause that's really what this is a part of. It's a part of those reflective practices, remembering and giving thanks. And it's remembering the hard times and the happy times, the joyful times and the, the very challenging times. And you mentioned journaling for a long time. I've been journaling for a long time too, but what I'm finding, Matt, the older I get, the fewer words I'm actually writing. Hmm. And I'm, I've been doing for a while, I've been sort of concentrating on, because <laughs> my mom lost her ability to handwrite. She was a stenographer and a, and a secretary for her, her work years, and she lost her ability to handwrite. And you could barely read what she was scribbling. And I've had that start for me. I feel like I'm just scribbling now and I can't see. So I have purposed, for example, if I'm writing just a verse or a word or a phrase, I'm purposing to handwrite it beautifully, as beautifully as I can, so that it slows me down. It helps me concentrate literally on every letter I'm writing in my journal. And has really helped me pray and focus my attention on kind of a laser focused, I'm going to stick with this word for today and let it go deep into my soul. So I find that um, similar to Jesus, because I think as Jesus aged in his years of ministry on earth, uh, as, his, as his the end was coming near, he was using less words as well. Fewer words, more about presence, more about poignancy, more about the particularity of what was coming for him. So it's not doesn't have to be a lot of words. It can be a few words. It can actually be a picture. It can actually be something that you're drawing, you're doodling. Um, I think there needs to be a lot of freedom in how we journal. We don't want to lock people up into the journal corner, you know, and say, this is how you must do it. But we are inviting people to journal as a way to reflect, to remember, and to give thanks. Yeah, there are, there are absolutely countless ways to do that. As you were talking about, you know, kind of economizing words, a, a dear friend of mine, I know that when he journals, he, will um, part of his prayer for his kids and for his grandkids is for Christ to be in the center of everything they do. And so he's shown me his journal before and he has, you know, in almost every entry that he has, there's just a C with a circle. And that represents to him Christ in the center, Christ in the center. Um, and I love that. That's, that's his way of doing that. And I'm going to ask you, Steve, to share a few practical suggestions. But before I do that, I would love to kind of dispel perhaps this myth or this misconception that journaling is um, looks anything like a diary 
or what maybe some baggage that we have with that, even the whole sort of masculine, feminine, male, female thing of, you know, women are more inclined to journal because maybe growing up they had or kept a diary and maybe some men, you know, have a bad taste in their mouth about that. And I love Richard Peace's um, quote on that where he says a journal is more than a diary. It does not so much record our days as record our spirits. Our inner world is so murky, so hidden, yet so potent. And to know oneself from within is so powerful, so difficult, so vital. That comes from his writing in Spiritual Journaling and the Witness of the Spirit. And so I think you and I both agree. Um, our inner lives Men and women, our lives are murky, hidden, so potent, and to know ourself is so powerful, so essential, so vital. And so, Steve, would you share some of those suggestions of how people might enter into this world of journaling? Yeah, I think the first practical question you need to ask is about privacy. Are are you um, going to write your journal and then burn them? <laughs> are you going to preserve them? <laughs> Are they going to stay in the family lineage or are they going to go in your casket at the end of your life? I mean, the, the issue of privacy is really important. And for your loved ones and you to have a conversation about that, I think would be really, really helpful because I've tried to treat my journals as an incredibly private between me and God experience. And so there's stuff in there I hope is not going to be hurtful or shameful for my loved ones. I don't think it will be, but they'll see how often and how frequent they were on my heart and my mind. And friends as li alike and fam extended family. Uh, I know I've journaled about my grandfather, who is a significant person in my life, and but he's he's long gone with, with the Lord. And so I, th I think privacy is an important word to reflect on. Um, secondly is the word honesty. Because if you're, if you're going to do a journal, ideally, you want to be really honest. You want to be, even the word raw would be an appropriate one here. What's the raw material of your life that you're writing out? Be as honest as possible. You mentioned the difference between men and women. I do think there's a big, a big difference between us. And all of my work in direction is with men. And I, I really am trying to get them to understand the affect or their feelings mm. um, because we we have feelings. We're, we're very, uh, you know, rich and vibrant in our life. We, we're not minus feelings, but we're minus sometimes an attentiveness to our feelings. So noticing our feelings, noticing the affect uh, honestly is, I think, super helpful for our journal. I think thirdly, the practical word would be variety. Feel free to handwrite or doodle or sketch or rewrite a passage of scripture, maybe in different colored inks, um, choose different ways to journal, um, different kinds of journals. So a variety will keep your journal creative. I think the fourth key word is the word ordinary. You don't want to make this a journal just about the extraordinary experiences of your life. Instead, make them about your ordinary life. And the ordinary life is the noticing life. It's it's the attentive life to the to the ways in which God is showing up in the mundane, in the day-to-day, -day, in the very ordinary parts of our lives. And I think the last key word, Matt, not just privacy, honesty, variety, and ordinary, but I think the fifth one would be daily. And if not daily, frequently. So whatever that frequency may be, uh, there were seasons for me, and there, there are even now seasons for me where like Sunday morning, where I'm having longer time with the Lord, you know, for me to have more time to journal and reflect, or maybe midweek for you or an early morning or even a late night. But frequency, uh, I think, matters in terms of taking your journaling and your reflective practices seriously for the, for the sake of the depth of your soul. 
Yeah, Steve, I, I love, I love those words, privacy, honesty, variety, ordinary, and daily. Great practical suggestions for utilizing a journal and uh, a regular discipline and practice of reflection. Yeah, and in and, and this writing as well, we write, you know, may God richly bless each of our desires to go deeper in our life of prayer, contemplative Bible reading and reflective journaling, to be patient in the process of stripping away old habits and acquiring new ones. It's there that God's love will be revealed in renewing ways as we pursue our daily practices as a disciple of Jesus Christ in earnest pursuit of holy living in a very dark and needy world. Matt, I'm, I'm just convinced that out of the depth of our soul, that's where we discover vitality in our service to Christ and his church. And when we talk about being discerning leaders, discerning leaders are noticing God. They're just, they're just attuned to noticing. And I, I think the practice of journaling really helps you to notice. So I wonder if you could just, you know, take us as you've been doing, take us into an experience of reflecting on this concept of journaling. And let's see what God has for each of us as a result today. Will you, will you do that for us, brother? Yeah, let's enter into that space together. I invite you into a posture of prayerful reflection. Whether you're going on a walk, you're driving in the car, or seated comfortably in a chair, Consider this an invitation to notice God, Father, Son, and Spirit. You're invited into a deeper awareness of His presence and His work in your life. So over the next few minutes, would you consider these questions and reflect upon them? Perhaps you'd like to open one or both of your hands in a posture of receptivity. Maybe you'd like to pause this podcast between questions. But either way, may these moments be received as a gift as you commune with the triune God. As you consider the spiritual practice of journaling, consider these words. Privacy. Honesty. Variety. Ordinary. And daily. privacy. In the exercise of journaling, will this be a private space for you?
honesty. What would it look like for your journal to be a space, to be honest, transparent, a place to contain confessions of sin, to recount the joys that you experience, to give voice to your needs, past, present, and future experiences. What would it look like for that to be a space of honesty? Variety. Consider various ways to use your journal. Perhaps it will contain prayers, reflections, words of poetry, drawings, or other creative ways to express your soul to God. Ordinary. How might your journal be used to recall and to record ordinary moments, ordinary days, ordinary experiences? Daily, how might the spiritual practice of journaling invite you into deeper communion with God each day?
Thank you, Matt, for leading us through this practice so reflectively and graciously. Our hope and our prayer at LTI is that reflective journaling will take root in the heart and soul of our listeners. Because if we're going to be coming discerning leaders and discerning learners, uh, these practices will deepen our soul. LTI is here for you, friend, as your companion on this spiritual journey. So don't hesitate to reach out. Simply go to leadershiptransformations.org. And now may the Lord bless and protect you. May the Lord's face radiate with joy because of you. May he be gracious to you, show you his favor, and give you his peace. The Discerning Leader podcast is made possible by the generosity of friends like you. To encourage our team with a gift of any amount, please visit leadershiptransformations.org. Send along a note with your gift. We'd love to hear from you. Remember, a listening leader is a discerning leader. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on the Discerning Leader podcast.